by the grace of God, the message for today is titled Sacrificial Living. Sacrificial Living. And our text is from the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And here is Apostle Paul speaking in, um, in his letters to the church. It says, therefore, I heard you. Or you can say persuade, encourage, appeal, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. He is pleading. He is begging the church. He, even though this was what it was right for the church to do, he was begging them. He was pleading. He was appealing to them that they should please in the view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done for them, in view of how God has revealed himself to them, that they should present their bodies as a living sacrifice. He did not just say sacrifice, but he said a living sacrifice, you know. It's a kind of sacrifice that is holy, that is pleasing to God. Not pleasing to ourselves, not pleasing to men, but rather that is pleasing to God. Why? Because this is the true and proper worship. And I pray that God Almighty himself, by spirit, will give us the grace to, you know, to, to, to offer to him a true and proper worship in Jesus' name. Amen. We have learned many, many things, so many things about the life of Jesus, you know, the way he lived. Because Jesus lived by example. He lived in the way that he wanted us to live. He lived in the way that he expected us to live. He did not live in such a way that was, that was unattainable for us, that was out of this world for us to attain. He lived. He was God, but he came as a man. And he lived not as God, but he lived as, a, 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 you know, as human. He lived as a, as a servant. God lived this, you know, he, he, you know, he, should, he would learn many things. The way that he interacted, you know, with the people around him. The way that he interacted with believers and even sinners. God interacted with sinners. He did not cut himself away from them. We know of the pastor that said that God went into the house of Matthew. Matthew at that time was a tax collector. God went in, you know, to have um, supper, you know, to, to fellowship with him. And of course, there were people, the Pharisees and whatnot, they did not approve or they felt like he was wrong. Uh, but one of the greatest examples that Jesus portrayed and that he expects of us is a life of sacrificial living and its benefits. And we know that the birth of Jesus, even to his death and even his resurrection and even his flame now in glory, speaks of a life of sacrifice. The Bible tells us in John 3.16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How many of us here can give up our child? Let's, not, let's even leave that. How many of us here can give up our car, what we have, even our money to say that we give it to God? But God, because he loved us, because he cared for us, because he, you know, he, he, you know, he, he saw us. Because he cared so much for us, he gave his only son. He did not have two sons. He did not have three sons. You know, he did not have 12 sons like Jesse did, but rather he had only one son. And he gave up the son, not because he had anything to benefit from it directly, but because we have something to benefit from it. And he said that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because he knew that it is through the death of Jesus Christ that we may have everlasting life. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. And unfortunately, the world we live in today is a world that is filled with hatred. A world that is filled with discord. A world that is filled with fear, that is filled with selfishness, that is filled with pride, that is filled with, you know, self-importance. It's all about me. It's all about the glory I can, I, I, you know, I can, I, I can attain for myself. It is all about the wealth I can accumulate for myself. You know, and we, it's like we don't care about other people. We don't care about what happens to other people. It's all about me, 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 me. And these things, you know, are not happening necessarily because, you know, there's a shortage in resources. It is not because, you know, you know, of the presence of the instrument of destruction. But rather, it is because we as a people, we are becoming so selfish and we are all about self-preservation. We, we don't care about what happens to our neighbors as long as we are secured. We don't care if that country is being bombed, if that country is being destroyed, as long as our own country is being preserved. We don't care if the children, you know, in that country are killing themselves, you know, as long as, as, long as our own children you know, 
are, are preserved as long as they are, as long as as long as it is well with them you know and and you know even even when it comes to money wealth we are hoarding things to ourselves we want to be uh, um, number one in Forbes magazine the richest person in the whole world we want to be the first at everything someone sneezes today they will say oh the first African American to sneeze in space it's like we are all about honor. We are all about people seeing us, you know, seeing what we do and giving us glory for that. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. You know, we do all these things so that we can have a place of power and so that we can have a place of importance over people. And, you know, if we that are Christians, if we that we proclaim that we say we are Christians, if only, you know, we can truly live as Jesus did. If only we can live even as the early church did if you feel like you know living like jesus did was unattainable how about people like paul how about people like peter how about people like abraham these were human beings these people had a father and a mother you might say yes jesus christ was conceived by the holy spirit you might say yes he had no father but he had the mother but what about people that you know that were flesh and blood people they lived a life that was honorable you know, even just like Apostle Paul, he considered everything as loss. As loss. So he gave himself to Christ wholly. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. You know, if only we can live a, a life, you know, that, that Jesus lived, then this world will be a better place. It is possible. So people have given up on the world. They feel like it cannot be better. Yes, it cannot be better if we keep going the way we are going. If we keep treating the, each other the way we are treating each other. If one nation is rising against each other. If one nation is boasting and saying that, oh, we have you know, a, a weapon of mass destruction. We can just launch, you know, the, the, this weapon. And if we keep doing that, yes, it will never be a better place. But if only we can come to a place of living sacrificially for each other. Then we can come to a place where even unbelievers can come and to you and say, I want to know this God. That you're talking about i want to know this god that has transformed your life i want this to know this god that has changed your lives and i pray that god will help us in jesus name you know the book of acts 4 34 the bible tells us that there was no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them this was talking about the apostles you know after jesus had resurrected you know when the church churches started prol uh, proliferating when the church when churches were being established as a people as believers there was none that had you know they, they, they sold people that had houses they sold them people that had land they sold them not because they not so that they can put the money in a bad bank account but rather so that the money can be used to the benefit of everyone so that there is no one person in their midst coming to say oh can i please have a cup of water or can i have can i can i, can I borrow a uh, cup of rice but the whole bible tells that none of them were in need yes there might be a want because as we know there's a difference between need and want Need is something that you need, something that will preserve your life. Want is something that you don't, you don't need it. It's just a want. It's just to satisfy a desire. Bible tells that there was none that was in need in their midst. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. And John 13 verse 34 and 35 says, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you too are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have loved and if you have love and, un, and unselfish concerns for one another, this was a message from Jesus. He was telling us, He's telling us here that I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another. Loving one another is living sacrificially to the benefit of, of others. He's, you know, he's saying that by this, by the way we live our lives, that is how people, that is how we, what we call unbelievers can come to know that indeed we are of God, that we indeed we follow Jesus. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. And going on into the message, we want to address, you know, this question, what is sacrificial living? What is sacrificial living? For us to know how to live sacrificially, we need to understand what sacrificial living itself means. And, you know, that sacrificial living consists of two words. The first one is sacrificial or sacrifice. And the other word is living. And you know, sacrifice is described as offering of food. I, I think I got this from Wikipedia or somewhere. It says, sacrifice is the offering of food, object, or the lives of animals to a higher purpose, in particular divine beings, as an act of propitiation or worship. We that we are Africans, 
we are very very familiar with this you know with this with this word with this concept sacrifice where you see people you know they put um they put uh, a bowl you know with food or fruit in it they place it somewhere as a sacrifice to something you know as a as an act of worship or, or propitiation or or you know or, or they need a change so they they need a change in their life so they they, they place the offering there as, as a sacrifice you know and it is giving up something for the sake of others oftentimes we will tell children that they need to learn to share that they need to learn to sacrifice things. That means you need to learn to give up things for the sake of others. That is what it means to be sac to you know sacrifice. And we know from Jesus Christ, He sacrificed Himself. He sacrificed His own life, that we may have life abundantly. And the other part of the word of, of, of you know of, of that topic is living. What is living? Living may refer to life. It is a condition that distinguishes organism from in inorganic object and dead organisms. A living species is one that is not extinct. You know, when they talk about animals, they say some animals are extinct. Why? Because they can't find a living version of that animal. They might have it stuffed somewhere, but they can't find a living version of that animal. That's why they say it is extinct. So when we say living, what, is, what does it mean? And oh, sorry, bring those two words together. When we say sacrificial living, it means we offer ourselves to God willingly. It means living for a greater purpose. Even if such a person may not directly benefit from his or her action. We live in a world today where we do things only because we have something to gain from it. We do things only because we know that it will benefit us. I, you do this because, oh, when I put my $10 here, I will get $20 back. You don't do it that, oh, when I put my $10, I might not get anything back. You do it because you want something. You have an, a vested interest in that thing. It is giving up your so-called right for the benefit of others. A lot of us, we are caught up in the way people perceive us we want people to, to honor us we want people to you know carry us you know we want people to treat us with respect and we are not willing to do the same thing we want people to call us mr mrs brother auntie sister we are so caught up in that title that we forget what it means to live sacrificially sacrificial living is placing other people above yourselves it is not easy, but the, if you want to live a life that is pleasing to God, this is how you have to live. It is living intentionally. It is not something you do subconsciously, but it is something you are intentional about. Why? That glory may come to God. Jesus came to this earth to redeem us from our sins, and his actions did not necessarily benefit him, for he was beaten, he was whipped, they cut his skins so that we might be healed. So that we might benefit in terms of healing. His own skin had to be ripped open. He had to be beaten. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He had to be wounded. For us to be healed. And it's also written that he was shamed. He went through, you know, he went through hunger so that we might receive him in riches. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for the sake, for your own sake, for my sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. He became something that was not good, so that we might attain something that was good. He was wounded, he was beaten, so that we might be healed. And yet the Bible said that he became rich, we know that God, that is the God that owns the cattle on the thousand hills, you know. He owns everything. He created everything. Bible tells us that there's nothing that was created that was not created by God. He owns everything. But yet, he took on poverty. That we, ourselves, might be rich. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. And we know ultimately he died so that we may live again. Jesus, he died so that we may live again. Romans 5, 8 says, And God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet unworthy, while we were yet undeserving, he gave up his only son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. How many of us today will do good for someone that we think they don't, that does not love us? How many of us today will do something good for someone that we feel like, oh, they are not in our camp? How many of us, you know, would do something? You know, some, some of us that are married, even with our spouses, we do this. Just because, you know, we are, we, we've not gained any, we, because we feel like they've not been good for us, 
we, 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 we retaliate by not being good to them. But here the Bible is telling us that God demonstrated his love. That while we were yet sinners, that while we were yet buried in our sins, buried in our old ways, he gave Christ to die in our place. Why? Christ died so that we may live. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Jesus was God. And he had the choice to live like God on earth. He had that choice. It was his right. It was his. But yet he chose to live like a slave. How many of us today can choose to live like a slave? Even though, how many of us can choose to subject ourselves? Even though you feel like you have uh, two bachelor's degrees, you have a master's degree, you have a PhD, you have you know, all these honorary degrees. How many of you are, you are willing to bring yourself lower than someone that has a high school degree or someone that has a diploma that did not even finish high school? But Jesus was God, and yet he did not, cons you know, Bible, let's just read Philippians 2, 6 to 7, it says, Jesus, he was talking about Jesus, who being in the very nature, in all totality, he was God. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Despite he was God, he did not use it to his own advantage. Uh, advantage. When he was nailed to the cross, even they were telling him that, if indeed you are the son of God, you know, cut yourself down, release yourself. But he did not do that. Even when they came to arrest him in the garden of Gethsemane, and, and one of his disciples cut off the ear of the soldiers, what did Jesus do? He, he fixed the ears, he healed that man. And he told his disciples that if, you know, I have at my calling, I can call 12 legions of angels. I, I, they are at my disposal right now. But what? He did not use that. So just reading that, uh, passage, that Bible verse again, it says, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. The Bible did not say something. But nothing, zero, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. It was God. He can choose to act like God anytime, he, as God anytime he wanted. But for our own sakes, for so that we may gain eternal life. So that, you know, the, the, the yoke of sin and death may be broken from our lives. The Bible tells us that he took the very nature of a servant and made himself, you know, and, and lived as a human being. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. He lived not to the glory of himself, but to fulfill the purpose of our Heavenly Father. The Bible tells us in John 5, 19, it says, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. A lot of us, we call, we say God is our Father. But are we today doing what we see God do, or what we know God to be? We know God is pure. We know God is holy. God cannot be, you know, his eyes cannot be old iniquity. We know he does not like many things, but still we choose to live that way. But Jesus here is saying that he, he, he himself, even he himself as God, he cannot do anything of, him, of, his, of his own self. But he only does what he, saw, what he sees his father do. Because whatever he sees his father do, that is what he does. That is what his purpose is. And he was willing to lay down his life. In John 10, uh, John 10, 18, it says, No one take it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. No one can take it away from God, but yet, from Jesus, but yet, he, he of his own volition decided to give down, you know, to put down, to release his own life. How many of us can say that? That so that someone can abuse you or so that someone can misuse you, you are willing to lay down your pride. But today we hold our pride in esteem above everything. We feel like, I don't want that person disrespecting me. I'm older than her, I'm older than him. Who do they think, you know, I don't want them oh, speaking to me anyhow. Because, you know, we are not the same category. Jesus was in the category. You cannot even categorize Jesus because he's God. But yet he's saying that I lay my own life down of my own accord. Nobody forced him, nobody compelled him, but of his own accord, he laid it down. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. One thing we need to understand is our life is not our own. Yes, you might think, yes, your father and your mother, they came together, conception happened, you were given birth to, they raised you, you went to school, you accumulated degrees, you started a job, you were a CEO, blah, 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 blah. Ultimately, the overall thing is your life is not your own. Your life does not belong to you. 
And that is where we need to start, you know, changing the way we think, the way we approach things. Your life is not your own. You do not belong to the breath that you have. It is not because you yourself are put it there. It's not because your parents are put it there. It is God. And he can choose to take it whenever. But it's in his mercy, he's preserving us today. He has given us life so that we may live before him. Living a life of sacrifice is not a suggestion, as some may assume. Thinking, oh, you know, it, it will be good. It's not that it will be good. That is the right thing. Like Apostle Paul says, he said, that is your true and reasonable service. But, you know, rather we have, we have been bought with a price. And our master expects us to live a life worthy of him in the flesh. Like Jesus said, the command I received from my father, that is what he's doing. And we too today, what we should do is we should live as God has commanded, as God has expected us to do. In the book of 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. The sooner we can come to that realization, the sooner we can accept that fact, the easier it will be for us to live a sacrificial life to God. And I pray to God, I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Yes, we were once slaves to sin, and that is why we lived according to the flesh. But now that we have become transformed, that Christ gave up his life for us, in a, you know, he died in our stead, we are to live sacrificially unto the Lord. Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. He realized his life no longer belonged to him. Before then, he could make decisions. He could say, oh yes, I'm persecuting the Christians. He could say, I'm going here. He could say, I can abuse anyone that abuses me. He can say, I can maltreat whoever maltreats me. Before then. But now he's saying that, I have been crucified. When Christ was crucified on the cross, he said he was also crucified with Christ. And now, it is no longer him that lives. It is no longer Paul. It is no longer Peter. It is no longer Kweju that lives. But rather, Christ who lives in us. Christ who lives in me. And Paul says, the life I now live in the body, that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. We see in the scripture, the Lord encouraging us, urging us to live for him. For in so doing, we bring honor. In so doing, we worship him. In so doing, we bring glory to his name. The book of Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I heard you. We know this passage. This is our, you know, this is our text for today. It says, Therefore, this is Apostle, Apostle Paul speaking, and we know that we're speaking as led by the Spirit of God. He said, I encourage you, I plead with you, I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, in the view of what God has done for you, in the view of you know, God giving up Jesus Christ to die in your place on the cross of Calvary, I encourage you to give up your body. You know, as a living sacrifice, not as something that is dead, but as a living sacrifice. That means in your talking, in your eating, in your drinking, in your interaction, even in your sleeping, in everything you do, you need to live in a way that is holy and that is pleasing to God. It is not say pleasing to men. It is not say pleasing to yourself. It is not say pleasing to your husband, or please, but rather that is pleasing to God because this is your true and proper worship. Even the old summary of the commandment can be fulfilled by sacrificial living. You know? Because even looking at the old commandment, saying it says, you know, that shall love thy God, the Lord thy God, that shall not covet thy neighbor's wife, that thou shall not kill, that shall not steal. All this can be wrapped up, can be, you know, can, can be summarized, you know, can be fulfilled by living sacrificially. If indeed we love God, we will give up our lives in the service and honor of God. And that fulfills the first commandment. The book of Matthew 22, verse 37 to 38, God will say, Jesus is saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. For this is the first and the greatest commandment. The greatest commandment ever is that we love God with all that we have. When we realize that we do not belong to ourselves, but rather we belong to God, we will be able to submit to the Holy Spirit's help to help us to love God with our whole. And if we are willing to take the need of others above ours, then we will be fulfilling the second commandment. The, verse, the same verse, uh, the 39 verse, it's now that chapter 22, Matthew says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is telling us today that we need to love, that we should love God. It is the commandment. It is not a choice. If indeed 
you say you love God. If indeed you call yourself a Christian, if indeed you call yourself a believer, God is telling us today, Jesus is saying, saying in his word, that love, your, love the Lord your God. That means you, have called, you are calling God your Lord. He saying, love the Lord your God with all, he did not say with some, but with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Why? And see, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment, it says it's like it. That means we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to love our neighbors with all our mind, with all our heart, with all our soul. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So now we'll go on to talking about living sacrificially, how we can live sacrificially all day. You know, just going in depth into that topic. Now the question that arises, how do we, we that we claim to be lovers of God, we that we claim to be child of God, we that we claim to be light of this world, we that we claim that we want to make heaven, we that we claim that Jesus is our savior, that Jesus has come to redeem us from the, you know, from the power of sin and death. How are we to live sacrificially? And as indicated in the beginning of this message, Jesus is our perfect example. He's our perfect example for living sacrificially. For the patriarchs that came before him, you know, the Moses, the Abraham, the Noah, the David, Bible said in the book of John 10, it says, all who came before me, or Jesus was saying, he said, all those that came before him, they were thieves, they were robbers, but the sheep had not listened to them. All those that came before Jesus, they were thieves, they were robbers, they were murderers. There was always something you could point to, you know, that would, you know, that, that, that would bring them into a negative light. But we know that Jesus Christ is the perfect example, is the perfect way to be. And the Bible says that we should be imitators of God. When the Bible tells us to do something, it is not because it is impossible, but rather because it is possible. But it is not our own choice whether we want to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit to help us to live that life. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. And for the sake of this teaching, sacrificial living will be categorized into two you know, categories. The first one is relationship with the people around us. It does not, it does not, I'm, I, don't literally mean, I don't literally mean someone that's standing next to you, but human beings, people of the world. The way we relate to each other and also our fellowship with God. I'll just say that again. For the sake of this teaching, we will be you know, approaching you know, sacrificial living from two aspects, from two categories. And the first one is our relationship with each other. And the second one is our fellowship, our relationship with God. And, you know, going on to, you know, going on to our relationship with others, we will be looking at it from two different angles, from two different examples, you know, using Jesus Christ. And the first one here says, Jesus lived and died for the people who hated and rejected him. This is an example. He did not live and die for those that were for him. He did not die for those that approved him. But he did not, come, he did not die for those that liked him. The, he said he came and his own did not receive him, but they rejected him. His own spat on him. He came, he lived and died for the people who hated and rejected. The Bible tells us, that we read that passage, he said, um, um, he said um, even while we were yet sinners, he died for us. In, uh, the book of Romans 5.10 says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of a son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We shall be fully saved by his life. There is a wrong, you know, there's a misconception in the way we live our lives today. There's a principle of, you know, where people believe that, you know, you, you should be nice to people that are nice to you. You should be honest, you know, with people that are honest with you. You know, you should be, you should be, you should reach out to people that reach out to you. You should only call people that call you. Or you should only fellowship that people, you know, that think like you, that do this like you. You know, uh, you should, yeah, and, and people that don't talk to you, people that are not nice to you, you should cast them away because they are not in your realm of relationship or whatever, you know. That is, uh, that is one negative principle that we hold on to in this world today. But the honest truth, if we, if it is okay for us to be honest with each other, is that if we want to live sacrificially like Christ did, then we must learn to live even to the benefit of those who despise us like Christ did. We must learn to live to the benefit of those that don't like us, of those that don't want to see us, of those that don't want to hear about us, of those that, don't, that want nothing to do with us. We should learn to live 
to their own benefit. Many today despise Christianity. Not because of Christianity itself, but because we, some of us so-called Christians today, we only love ourselves and despise the world, which God himself sent us to reconcile. We Christians, we are very judgmental. Yes, the Bible says that we should judge. But the way we judge, rather than attracting people, we are, we are actually pushing people away. Because of the way we treat each other, because of the way, you know, in a church, you have, you know, the, 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 the shepherd over the church living, in, living, living a large life, living in a house with a gold toilet, having a private jet, having a mansion with like 20 rooms or whatever, or having different kind of cars. And they say it is because God has blessed them. But yes, God has blessed you, why? So that you can be a blessing to other people. Unbelievers are watching. You think they are not what They are watching. And unfortunately, this is some of the things that turn them away from Christianity. They say those people that don't love themselves. You have one person being the mega person, the richest person. And you have people, majority in the church, living in poverty. Living under the bridge. With no food to eat. With nothing. Their children wear tattered clothes. Nothing. And you have one person that is living rich, that is living at large. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. There is um, some, uh, you know, it is said that India, some people said it's Gandhi that said it. And another people said it was, uh, you know, Baradada, an Indian philosopher that said it. But anyway, the quote goes like this. Jesus is ideal and wonderful. But you Christians, you are not like him. These people, even people that call, that call themselves uh, unbelievers or atheists, whatever, some of them, they've read the Bible. They know what, what Christ is like. They know Christ's expectation. But they now see that we, that we are saying that we are living in accordance to the Bible. We are living contrary to what that Jesus is calling for. And there's also a quote from Gandhi that reveals the truth that we Christians do not live like Jesus you know, that we claim to follow. You know, there's a quote. The quote said, you know, they said, Gandhi said, you Christians, you know, that you do not live like Christ, you claim to follow, but you live for yourselves. He said, basically, well, I read the story. The story was that, you know, as we know, Gandhi, a philosopher, you know, he reads. He's a guy that reads. Men. I heard that he read the gospel. And of course, from what he read, he was, he was curious. He was intrigued by this Jesus. And I said, okay, wow, I'm intrigued by this Jesus that these believers are following, that these believers are, you know, are worshipping. And on a Sunday, he decided to go to church. You know, there's something different. There's, there's, there's a difference between you reading something and you being able to experience it on a practical level. He went to church, and when he got to that church, I, heard, I read that people at the door or to that church, they told him he couldn't come inside. They told him that he could not enter. Why? They said because that church... Where, where that church was for people of esteem. That church was for people of a higher class. Was, a peop, was, was for people, you know, that had, or was for Caucasian people that had white skin. Was for a special people. And because of that, he went back and he turned away from Jesus. Had he been allowed to enter that church, who knows what Gandhi would be today. Perhaps he would have been an apostle for God. He would have been, you know, like Paul. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So like we were saying, that Christians do not live like Jesus we claim to follow. We live only for ourselves. We preach so that we can make money from the church. We publicly do good deeds so that people can praise and give us award for our actions. The best pastor of the year. The number one pastor in the whole wide world. The richest pastor in the whole wide world. But is this what Jesus came for? Even when they came to Jesus and they called him teacher, I said, no, I'm not your teacher. I'm not, don't want you to call me teacher. They called him Lord. He said, no one should call me Lord. Was he not God? Was he not a teacher? But he said, no, he did not come for title. He did not come for people to serve him. Rather, Jesus came to serve. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So we do many things that we do so that we can receive the praise of men, so that we can receive the award for our actions. Rather than being that map, rather than being that, you know, that beacon of light that people will see, that would, that would make them to be attracted to Jesus, we are now becoming that avenue through whom people are now turning their backs to God. You want to tell someone about Christ, they will say, eh, Christ? 
Look at all those Christians. Are they not the ones do, uh, committing fornication? Are they not the ones committing adultery? Are they not the ones you know, beating their wives? Are they not the ones maltreating their children? Are they not the ones not, you know, not taking care of their family? Are they not the ones amassing wealth for themselves while a majority of those that are in the church are impoverished? But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. As believers, let us show the love, our love for God to a, to a dying world. Let us be kindly even when they say hateful, despiseful words about us. Let us give, even when they blatantly rob us. And let us bless when they curse us. The Bible tells us that even when we, when we bless those that curse, we are like heaping coals of fire. That should not be your, motivator for anything, your motivation for anything. Saying that, oh, because, you know, I'm heaping coals on fire on them, I'm going to be nice. No, just do it for the sake of God. You know, when people curse us, let us bless. Let us show that we do not hold on to this world like we will not leave it, you know, like this world will be forever. But rather let the world see that we live like strangers on earth. Like someone that is on a mission. Like on a temporary mission. Someone that is on a journey. That we know that this is not our destination. That this is only a bus stop. Where we get to, where we have a purpose to fulfill. The fact of the matter is that our pride will not take us anywhere. All that we have is material. All that we have was made from something. And these things will surely perish. Is it your car? Is it your Range Rover? Is it your Lamborghini or whatever that you're riding that is making you feel like you have arrived? That is making you feel on top of the world? Is it your one million dollar house? Is it that you have a house in Dubai? You have a house in South Africa? You have a house on the state that is making you feel like you have arrived? I'm sorry to break it to you. You have not arrived anywhere. Because this world that we live in it is fleeting. Today we are here and tomorrow we may be gone. And on that day when we stand before Jesus, when we stand before the, God, uh, the judgment throne, we will give an account of how we have lived our lives. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Our blessed hope is that one day we will be, re we will be re reunited with Jesus. We will be reunited with Jesus. A lot of us, we get so caught up in many things. We want to have five houses. We want to have businesses, you know. There is nothing wrong in pursuing good things. There is nothing wrong in pursuing, you know, in having businesses, in, in achieving success. Even God, even Jesus told us that whatever we lay our hands to do, we will achieve success, isn't it? Even the Bible tells that we shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That whatever we do, that we will prosper. Prosperity is our, is our, you know, is our right. God has given it to us. But the thing is, at what expense? What are you, are you, are, you know, are you, you know, are you pursuing these materialistic things so that men can honor you? So that your names can be in the, in the, you know, in, in the list or the books of who is who? You know, the first, the, the, the top ten, you know, uh, uh, ministers or whatever in the world. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Loving only those who love us is of no use. There is no gain. There is no, there is no benefit in it. It is of no eternal purpose. And it is not sacrificial. For even psychopaths love those who love them unbelievers do they love those who love them they give gifts to those who give them gifts especially during christmas you see people killing themselves trying to give gifts to each other and you know of someone that has no food you know of someone that's been laid off at their, at their place of work you know of someone that their children cannot return to school because their parents have no money to pay their school fees but rather you want to give that minister a big gift why so that he can receive a contract you want to give that rich uncle or whatever something so that they too they can bless you in return. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Luke 6.32 says, if you love those who love you, what credit, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And verse John 4.20 4, says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. That is the totality of it. We cannot say we love God if we do not love, if we don't care for the people that we sing. Yes, they may curse us, but the Bible is telling us that we should bless them. Jesus was persecuted. Well, did he destroy them? Did he call down fire to say, but if had we been some of us, we would have called down fire to destroy those people. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Like we said, we are looking at two, we are looking at uh, the relationship with others from two different angles. And the first one was that Jesus lived and died for the people that persecuted him, that abused him, you know, that, 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 that hated him. And the second angle is that Jesus lived as a role model. 
He lived as, a, as an example, an example that can be attained. Jesus lived the life that He wanted us, to, that He wants us to live. He did not just give us instructions and leave it out. And that is how most of us live now. We tell people how to live life, but we ourselves we don't live by example. Jesus washed His disciples' feet so that they can follow in His steps. And likewise, as believers, we are to live as role models here on earth. When I say role model, it's not in the area of like, uh, you ask someone who is my role model. And uh, my role model is Oprah. Uh, because she was the woman who was of nothing. And she's, she achieved. That is not what we're saying. Jesus should, if as believers, Jesus should be our role model. Jesus is the ultimate role model. This person that you're calling your role model, today they may be here, but tomorrow they are gone. We need to understand that our lives are as letters written by Jesus to an unbelieving world. So we, may, we must ensure that our words, our actions, you know, our interaction with people reflect Christ. Today, we believers, we do not consider the, that the world will speak of our actions, but we act based on our, on, on our selfish needs. Paul was willing to give up eating meat because it will make other people to backslide. There's something that most believers argue about drinking wine or drinking alcohol they say jesus is not ex you know explicitly say oh they cannot drink wine but what are we even arguing about you as a believer that your friend and unbeliever that unbeliever know that you're a christian or you like call yourself a christian go to their house and drink alcohol and see whether they will not judge you there is an expectation you know and the bible says in first corinthians 8 13 it says therefore if i eat if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fail. I will not cause them to fail. A lot of us, we say, oh, you cannot please people. Oh, Kitty, why should I do this? You know you cannot please people. Uh, whatever you do, whether you see people, are, some people are not happy. Whether you stab people, but the ultimate thing is here. There are some things that are just, they are not worth, just give it up. If it's something that will make someone to question your faith in God. I know, yes, we live in a world where we cannot please each other. But still live to God. That is why your life is to be lived to the glory of God. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. But today, many are not willing to give up anything for the sake of Christ. You know, is there anything that you are doing that is making those that are weak in faith or the world question if indeed you are a Christian? You have some brothers that call themselves Christians. And yet they have two, they have three girlfriends. You have some brothers that call themselves Christians. Yet they are about to get married to a girl and they say, oh, you have to be pregnant for me before we can marry is that right yes maybe the sister has lied or whatever but if you're in god's will god will not lead you to marry your enemy that is a fact and perhaps even if the child does not come it is not because the woman has messed up herself it is not because she has done anything but it could be just, you know like we know the story of that man that was born blind people were saying oh maybe it was his father that had sinned it was his mother but why was that man born blind? Because so that god may be glorified and the Bible says that God makes everything beautiful. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. For the sake of Christ, let us let go of such attitude. Let us go, let us go of such actions. For in so doing, we honor God. Not because we're trying to keep the law, but rather because we are winning people back to God. And just in relation to what I was saying before, like, you know, where people say, oh, no matter, I can't, I can't live to please people. Uh, because people will never be happy. Whether I put on hat, whether I expose my hair, whether I put on hearing. All those are just, you know, empty, empty discussions. Luke 7, 34, 35, 35, eh, Luke chapter 7, verse 33 to 35 says, For John the Baptist came, neither eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. And the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came. He was not eating and drinking. And what did they say? They said he is a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But the Bible says, wisdom is proved right by all our children. So it's not just today that you feel like, you know, whatever you're doing, you can never please people. In the time of John the Baptist, it was so. In the time of Jesus Christ, it was so. So how much more now? Well, the one thing that triumphs, that, you know, that supersedes everything is that you need to live your life to God. And the only way you can do that is by being led by the Holy Spirit. I pray God will help us. It says, yes, speak kindly to your spouse, not because you are wrong, not because you are the one that is wrong, not because your spouse is right, but because you want to be an example to your children. No matter how young our children are, they are watching. 
they are watching. That is why some parents, you know, they have a guest and they'll tell their children to say, oh, tell them mommy is sleeping. Tell them that is sleeping or that just went out. Yes, that child, that child my life, but that child is learning from that. Thinking that is the way to be. That is why sometimes our children, well, especially in this day and age, in those days you can't call out your parents. Children of nowadays, they will call you out. But daddy, you said that we should not lie. When they hear daddy, uh, daddy lying to mommy, saying that he went to the supermarket, whereas daddy went to the movies. Or whereas mo uh, mommy went shopping, whereas she told, uh, went shopping for clothes, whereas she told daddy that she went shopping for food. These children will call you out. We need to go the extra mile for each other, not because you have the strength, but because you want to honor God. In our marriages, we should honor each other. That is a commandment from God. For in so doing, we are honoring God. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So the second category, the first category we've seen is in our relationship, how we can live sacrificially in our relationship with, to each other. And the second one now is on how we can live in fellowship with God. And it says Jesus lived to do the will of the Father, right? We're using Jesus as an example to all this. It says Jesus lived to do the will of the, God, of the Father. God is the ultimate in our lives and we need, to solely, we need to live solely for him. The desire to please God should not supersede our desire to want to do anything. You know, should not supersede our desire to want to do anything. Should not supersede our desire to please others. Should not supersede our desire to revenge or to buy house, car, or even have anything to ourselves. But the Bible is telling us. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. In our eating, in our drinking, in our talking, in our just, in our reasoning, we are to honor God. John 6, 38, John 6, 38 Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus came not to do his own will, but rather to do the will of the Father. And this should be our own attitude as well. We are not here to do our own will, but rather our will to, is to be, do the will of our Father, God. And I pray that God will help us. Despite God is sovereign over all, we know that he will not come and force us to serve him. He will not come and force us to live in, in the way that he wants us to live. But rather, and we, you know, we may not even see his wrath on those who do not yet serve him. But we as wise people, we know that we need to put God first above all. We need to put God above. God is, should be first. First. Like the Bible says, Seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and every other thing shall be added. God comes first. When you place God first, then everything else will fall in line. Matthew 3, 9 says, And do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of the stones, God can raise up children of Abraham for, or, for Abraham. You might say, Oh, sometimes I believe in, uh, you know, living for God. Lives. But the Bible says that, if you choose not to do it, God can raise up stones. But I pray that God will not, you know, raise up stones in, in my own place in Jesus' name. Living righteously is being a strength to human nature. Can we just have Romans 12 verse 2 quickly? Romans verse 2 quickly on the screen. So I, living righteousness, righteously is not a strength to the human nature. But for the sake of God, we must seek after righteousness, holiness, and purity. For this is our true and proper worship for this is our true and proper worship this is our true and proper worship Romans 12 1 again says therefore I encourage you I plead with you brothers and sisters in the view of God's mercy offer your bodies a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God not pleasing to yourself not pleasing to the government not pleasing to society but rather pleasing to God for this is your true and proper worship like we were saying before yes people might say yes I, there's no need for me to live sacrificially because this is of no benefit to me because I'm living to God, I'm living to other people. What about me? What do I have to gain from it? And this is what we'll be addressing. We are looking at benefits of sacrificial living. Many assume that because sacrificial living is a lifestyle that is to the benefit of others and God, that there's nothing personal to gain from it. But on the contrary, there are many benefits that we cannot even in this topic, we cannot in this message exhaust. The number one thing that we need to, okay, number one benefit is we need to understand that the principle of this, we need to understand that the principle of this materialistic and wicked world in a way people say get as much as you can can as much as you get and sit on the can that is just a bunch of i don't know whatever that is what some people tend to believe you know get as much as you can you now save it you keep it then you now sit on it it's not of god and it's not it does not work when it comes to the kingdom of god the book of proverbs 11:24 says one person gives freely yet gains even more 
another we told on duty but come to poverty the one that their hands are always open the bible is telling us that they gain even more and the one that is holding it back that they don't want to share the bible says that they come to poverty so it is not in your degree it is not in your job or it's not in the career that you have that makes you rich it is god i pray god will help us in jesus name what we need to allow ourselves to understand is that when we live sacrificially, we are opening a door of blessings. Just that, like, like that Malachi 3.10 says, you know, it says, bring ye your tithe into the storehouse. storehouse. And it says, prove me in this. I will open the windows of heaven, right? He said, I will pour a, a blessing into it that there will not be enough room to contain it. When we live sacrificially, when we live to God, when we live, you know, to, 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 to esteem others above ourselves, we are opening the door of blessings to ourselves and therefore we never come to lack and therefore we never come to want. Those who live for themselves, those who hoard everything to themselves, they always come, they come to lack, they come to want. But those who give generously in wisdom and by the leading of the Holy Spirit always have more. For they have become a source of blessing to other people. In the book of 1 Kings 17, 15 to 16, the Bible tells us, She went away and did as, did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with the word of the Lord had spoken. This was a widow. She had maybe just a cup of flour. Uh, she had, um, yeah, right? She had just a little cup of flour and some things. She was just saying, oh, this is the last thing. Let me, well, I'll cook. And me and my two sons will eat. Uh, me and my sons will eat and will die. And that's it. But Elijah came to her. Elijah said, go and make for me bread. And even when you're coming, bring milk. Imagine someone that does not have anything. Here comes the prophet saying, go and make me bread. And bring milk with it. And she eat it. She obeyed. She did it. And because of that singular act, the Bible says that, you know, that the jug of oil, the flower never ran dry. She went from lack. She went from nothing. She, she went to abundance. And I pray that God will help us to live sacrificially so that we may attain the blessings that are stored up in it in Jesus' name. Number two benefit is sacrificial living in a, is an expression of our faith in God. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted in the world. The religion that God accepts of us is not to be, you know, it's not to run around judging other people. It's not to go around judging, you know, condemning people. But rather, it is to look out for those that are in need. It is to take care of those that are without parents. It is to take care of those that have lost their husband. That if they are rich, God is not saying, but rather those people that are actually in the place of need and to keep ourselves from being polluted. If we truly love God and want to live for him as we claim, then our lives will not be lit to ourselves, but rather to the glory and to the honor of God. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The way unbelievers can come to know Christ, the way unbelievers can come to glorify God in heaven, is through us. It's when our light shines. A lot of us, rather than have our light shine, we are blended. We are allowing ourselves to be just like the people of the world. There is no difference between us. You know, I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Abraham expressed faith in God by not questioning or doubting God when God told him to sacrifice his only son, son whom he loved and cherished. We all know the story of Abraham. At the age of 75, God called him out from amongst his family. Abraham, you would say, was not a believer. He was a pagan. He was a pagan, but called, God called him out and he listened to God. He went to where God, you know, God was saying that, ah, I will bless you through your seed. You know, the nations of the earth will do this and that. You know, he was saying that your descendants shall be like the sand of the sea. And Abraham at this age was without a child. But God, in accordance to his word, when Abraham was hundred, he gave him a child. And some years later, this same God is now coming and saying, take your son. God does not do something, you know, just because it, there's a purpose. He told them, he told them, this is how the Bible records it. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Three things, your son, your only one. Even despite um, Abraham had another son, Ishmael. But God is saying, your only son, whom you love. A son that took, at least from the time of promise, 25 years to manifest. God is now saying, go and kill him. Abraham did not say, ah, God, why are you asking me to do this? Why did you give it to, to me in the in, why did you give him to me in the first place if you want him to kill him? But what did Abraham did not well as far as we can deduce from the Bible, Abraham did not tell his wife, neither did he tell his son, 
he just took his son you know um, um uh, with his servant you know he just basically went and god because god said when he gets away he will sacrifice his son you know he will let him know he will show him and that happened and at that time you know when he just when he's about to sacrifice his, the, his son a voice came and told him don't do it god himself offered a sacrifice and with what abraham god said i know he said he knew that indeed abraham loved him abraham loved god above his son isaac his only son Abraham loved God above his wealth. He loved God above all else. And I pray that God will help us, that indeed we will live, you know, we will, we, will, we will express our faith in God in Jesus' name. And it was said of Abraham in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, it says, Abraham expressed faith in God. Sorry, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise, he had embraced the promise of God. God saying that, you know, that his, his, you know, that, that, that his descendant will be like the sand of the seashore. He had embraced the promise. He was not about to sacrifice his only, his one and only son. And he said, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring to be reckoned. Verse 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. He knew that if this God has told me to sacrifice my son, even if I sacrifice my son, he will raise him up from the dead. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. The third benefit is sacrificial living leads to divine encounter. Hebrews 13 2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. By being kind, you know, by living sacrificially, by placing others above yourself, some people have come to experience, you know, divine encounter. The Shunammite woman, she received the blessings when she had lost hope. On because she did not see her wealth only to her benefit, but she extended her kindness to Elisha, who then blessed her in return. 2 Kings 4, verse 13, 14 and 17 says, And they said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you, have, would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And they said, What then is to be done for you? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son and her husband is old, but the woman conceived, and she bought a son about that time, the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. This was a woman that prepared a room in her house for Elisha anytime he was in town. And Elisha came and said, what can I do for you? Because how can I repay you for your kindness? He said, should I talk to the king on your behalf? Should I, you know, to the commander, you know, to the people of prestige, to the people of royal, you know, royal people. On your she now said, no, I'm amongst my own people. She was not looking for fame. Some of us would say, yes. Give me Obama's number. Give my number to Obama. Yes. You know, we are carried away by all this materialistic. Materialistic. And even she has said she should not say what she wanted. It was Elijah's servant, um, Gehazi, that now said, she's old. Or, or, you know, she has no son and her husband is old. And Elijah, Elijah spoke the word. And according to the time of life, the woman brought forth. And I pray that in our sacrificial living, we shall experience a divine encounter in Jesus' name. Another benefit to sacrificial living is that it speaks for us in the day of disaster. Act 9.39 Act says, Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made. And while she, made while she was with them, Dorcas died. And when Peter came into town, all the people that, that benefited from Dorcas' um, 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 you know, kindness, they came to Peter. They began to show him that this was the robe she made for me. This was the robe she made for my child. Or when she saw that my clothes were tattered, she made this for me. And because of that, she was brought back to life. And also Ecclesiastes 11, 2 says, Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Dorcas died, but the life that she lived caused people around her to not want her to die. You know, they showed Peter the good things that she had done. And this inspired and intercession on her behalf in a time that she was dead, in a time that she herself cannot ask to be raised, to be brought alive. People that she had gone done good to, they, they, they interceded for her and indeed she was brought back to life. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. The fifth benefit is sacrificial living is the way up. Is the way up. We might think it's the way down. We might think, oh, it means that we are being abased, but rather it is the way up. 
Many assume that the way up is by putting others down. Because why you want to climb on top of people so that you can get, get to where you want to go. They think it is by striving to show ourselves, you know, better than anyone else. But this principle does not work. In my work in the world, in my work on Wall Street, in my work, you know, uh, when it comes to, you know, the worldly markets or whatever. But when it comes to the things of God, the things that matter, it does not work that way. Jesus is now enthroned on high and his name is exalted above any other name in heaven and even on earth and even beneath the earth, mainly because Jesus lived the sacrificial life. Philippians 2, 7 to 9 says, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the, the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him. God lifted him to a place, to the highest honor, and gave him a name that is above every other name. That is why we say today, at the name of Jesus, it's written in the Bible, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess at that name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name. Service to others is a way that we receive honor among others, even in the sight of God. Matthew 23, verse 11, he says, the greatest among you must be a servant. The apostles, you know, the disciples were arguing about who is going to be the greatest. They think Jesus did not hear them, Jesus heard them. And when he got to where they were going, he now asked them, what were you guys talking about? <laughs> and now they couldn't talk anymore. They couldn't even say what they were thinking, what they were saying. And God was, Jesus now told them that the greatest among you, you know, or he says the least among you shall be the greatest. The least among you shall be. But even if you want to be great, you have to learn to be the least. You have to humble yourself. You have to, you know, you have to put yourself in, in the position of servanthood. You have to serve. You cannot be the greatest by expecting other people to serve you. That is not how you become the greatest. But you, are the, you become great when you yourself are in a position of serving people. Jesus came to serve. He did not come to be served. He came to serve. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. The sixth benefit to sacrificial living is that it creates an atmosphere of peace and harmony. Living sacrificially creates an atmosphere of peace and harmony. Philippians 2, 3 to 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambitions or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. And that is what the Bible says, each of us. If I don't do anything out of vain conceit, I, you know, I esteem you above myself, you do, you treat me the same way, then there's peace, there's harmony. It says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus had that mindset of servanthood, of servitude. It says, if we are all willing to live sacrificially, to take the need and honor of others above ours, then the world will be the more glorious. For husbands will live with their wives with an attitude of understanding. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate, be mindful, you know, as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker vessel. It's not saying because, as the, as they, are, because they are weaker partner, but it says, treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you. That means we are co-heirs. We are, we, we are co, you know, we will co-inherit the kingdom of God. God did not say that, oh, because you are the husband, uh, because, you know, you have more portion, you have more uh, um, gifts or more, you know, uh, uh, reward in heaven. But it says because you are part, you no. Know, you are co heads you know, together, which you know, so as heads with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayer. Nothing will hinder. So, husbands, I beg you, you might say, Yes, you brought your wife to Canada, or you brought, or you got your wife that job, or, or maybe you felt like your wife was, you know, her family, they were impoverished, but you married her and you brought her into wealth. Please let that go. Jesus is, uh, the Bible says here that we need to concentrate even as we live with our wives. And we need to treat them with respect. Some, of, some men, they treat their wives as nothing. They treat their wives as beneath them. They now say, oh, I am the husband. You treat me with respect. You honor me. You, you know, you, 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 you submit to me. But submission, I'm not saying that a woman should not, but submission is easier. When you yourself, you respect your wife. You treat her. Even as the Bible says here, why? You know, you honor her. It's not her that you're honoring per se. It is the God. It is the God that you know has brought you two together. And the Bible is also telling, telling wives that wives submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. As you do to the Lord, you know, totally, in reverential, you know, 
uh, fear, submit yourself to your husband. A lot of people think that when they submit themselves to their husbands, that means their whole character is erased. That means they are not anybody. That means, you know, they think they lose their identity, but rather that's a lie. But rather your identity is reaffirmed when you submit to your husband, even as you submit to God. So we're saying, why submit to your husband, even as unto the Lord? For even if the submission is perceived by the man, even when the man mistreats you, even when the man is not doing his job as a man that God has made him to be in the wife, in the, in the family, what the Bible says, just submit. Just submit. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Even in, in regards to our children, a lot of us will think, yeah, because these are our children, our children, they are beneath us. We can order them around. We can treat them anyhow. Well, the Bible is encouraging us here. We need to treat each other with respect. We need to honor God. Husband, honor God. By the way, treat your wife. Wife, honor God in the way you treat your husband. Us, uh, couples, honor God in the way you treat your children, in the way you treat your family, in the way you treat those around you. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. You know, we wrote, if we all can live sacrificially, we will not forcefully take what belongs to others. Wars will be averted. There will be no killings in school today as we have it. And citizens will not need policing to do what is right. If only we can learn to live sacrificially. Place others above yourselves. When you place other, uh, others above yourself, it does not make you little. It does not take away who you are. It does not rob you of your identity, but rather your identity in Christ is being reinforced. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Like the, like the book of uh, Ecclesiastes says, uh, it says this is the conclusion of the matter. So the conclusion to this message today is, brothers and sisters, please, even as Apostle Paul says, I heard you, I encourage you, I plead with you, let us live sacrificially. For this is our reasonable service to God. God does not need our money. Some people, they've chosen not to go to church or to interact with people of, you know, believers anymore because they believe that church is all about money. God does not need your money. The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which is sought to your ancestors as it is today. It is God that, what that thing that you think you have, that $30 billion in your account or whatever that you think you have, it is God that gives you the power to make it. To make it. God does not need your money. But we can honor him with our money by taking care of the poor with it. James 1.27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widow in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You can do all these things and still pay your tithe. Some people, all they want to give God is just their 10%. They don't want to give God that another 10%. And that is why they are arguing that, oh, instead of giving my tithe to church, I cannot use that money, that 10% to give to the orphans, to give to the, you know, uh, widows. Aside, outside from our tithe, God is telling us here that we should live sacrificially. Take care of those people that I need. Yes, we cannot take care of everyone in the world. But that person that you see, that person that you know, that they are in need I'm not saying want here. There, there, I need. We need to give to them. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. We will never see Jesus thirsty, hungry, or sick. But we can feed him by feeding those that are less privileged. Can, we please, can you please open up Matthew 25, verse 35 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Verse 36 says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, in as much, as you did it to one of the least of this, my brethren, you did it to me. Yes, we might not see God physically. We might not see God high to high, you know, to, to give him, you know, to surrender all that we have to him. But we can do this indirectly, directly, by living sacrificially to the people around us. By giving. 
in giving you are blessed in giving you come to abundance in giving you can never lack you know they will say something that it is someone that that their hands are open that can receive because for you to give that means your hands are open and as your hand is open you can receive and i pray that god will help us in jesus name let us live let us no longer live for ourselves desiring mansion desiring desiring Range rover yes it is a good thing to want these things but don't don't want these things above what god is calling us to do let us use what god has given us god told uh, abraham he said in blessing i'll bless you so that it can be a blessing to others he did not say that i'll bless him so that i can amass wealth and leave it to his generation but he said so that it can be a blessing to other people so let us leave so that we can serve others with the gift that God has freely given unto us. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. That indeed, as we live, as we honor God, that he will say of us on that day, Welcome into my rest. Welcome to, you know, my faithful servants. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for today. And Lord, even as your word has come for this morning, we ask, O oh God, that we will not forget it, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that we will not cast it away, O oh God. We will not think it impossible, O oh Lord. But the grace to live sacrificially for you, Lord. The grace to live sacrificially for others. To hold all that in esteem above ourselves, O oh God. Father, you will give unto us in the name of Jesus, O oh God. That on that day, Lord, this word, O oh God, this message, O oh God, will not condemn us, O oh God. Father, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, to be practical, O oh God, in what we have learned, O oh God. That indeed it may be well with us, spirit, soul, and body, O oh God. Father, thank you for all that you have done, O oh God. For in Jesus' name, we are praying. Amen.